going to start this project the same way that we started the last one. We're starting with these two slats and we're going to be tracing the sword onto these slats and cutting them out. That's the easy part. What I'm also going to do is make sure that you have a little uh, timekeeper that shows you how much time I've spent on each part of the project. And that way, overall, you'll be able to see, you know, how long is this going to take? It's sort of a common question, like, how long did that take you? And I want to show you that. So we're going to trace the sword here. Uh, you need to be as precise as possible and make sure you're being aware of what your hilt looks like, what your cross guard looks like. So if it dips down like mine does, you'll need to account for that. So the next thing here is just to cut this out. We want to be as precise as possible. I'm using the uh, four and a half amp jigsaw made by Black & Decker. I've used this for lots of projects. This is really uh, trustworthy. You know, it's it does the job. It's super cheap. And uh, the the uh, blade that I'm using here is like, it's either medium or fine. Um, you could use a coping saw. You could use all sorts of different types of saws, just depending on how difficult you want to make it for yourself. Um, I think this method works pretty well. There's not too much of a mess to do this outside just because of all the sawdust here. And uh, once we get this as precise as possible, we'll have the two halves ready to go here. They'll need to closely match because, of course, you've got the two sides and the inner profiles need to match up too. This is why being precise is really important. So the cutouts uh, have our, our tracing on them and they are ready to be carved out. So this part is sort of a time intensive part. It, there's not any real easy shortcuts. Uh, you could use a Dremel if you want, but clearing out the wood, making sure that you don't cut out too much, uh, you know, it's going to be just time intensive. So uh, how long does this take? I'm going to check, but I think these have taken about an hour to an hour and a half uh, per side. And you might be able to do it faster than that. It may take you longer uh, if it's the first time that you're trying to carve. Um, but what I use are these simple cheap carving tools. They're about a buck a piece. Because these are so cheap, I have just been buying new ones and when they get dull, but kept all the old ones in case, you know, one day I get around to actually sharpening them. But they work pretty well. So I use the one that has the little scoop. I also use the one that has the uh, right angle, the 90 degree angle. You don't want to put your hands in front of it here because there's a good chance that it will slip and cut you pretty badly. So I like to keep my hands back here. As we get towards the center here, you're going to be cutting a little deeper. Of course, that's all dependent on the profile of your sword and whether it has a distal taper. Uh, you'll have to make sure that it fits well. This part of my hand will get pretty badly irritated if I don't use a Kleenex or a piece of cloth back there. Uh, so it just aids in the, uh, in the comfort. You want to make sure you're not going too deep. You can't put the wood back. You can only take it out. So just be aware of how deep you're going. Once you get the profile cut out pretty well, you'll start testing it, see if you can get a good fit there. Uh, this one is roughly carved out here. It took about an hour and a half to get that done. Uh, maybe a little bit less. I'm going to call that an hour and a half though. Let's see if this one takes less time to carve out. Once it's carved out, we'll sand it. So I use the V-shaped gouge make sure I stay within these lines and we want to make sure our hands stay behind the gouge never in front of it you need to turn the piece around to come from the opposite direction that works so right here we've got the throw pretty thin uh, it's not too thin though should be okay and yeah, this is what we're aiming for all the way down to the tip we've got that cut out and at this point what it needs is um, some sanding we have to sand this out and then we'll try to fit the blade in there uh, if it turns out that there there's a lot more room that needs to be created uh, within these wooden core pieces to accommodate the uh, the sword then we might have to get the gouges back out the whole time we do this we need to make sure that the sword is fitting so uh, I'm not just carving out the core I'm actually checking every once in a while to make sure that it fits the sword and uh, as we get closer and closer, we are more careful with how much we're taking out, how much we're removing there. So you've done a lot of work. It fits now. Um, you can slide it into the, the scabbard, the wood core, and it, it does fit very well. We want to make sure that the sides 
Uh, there's no gap there when you close it up. And uh, if it's good, then you're ready to glue it. You're ready to glue those two sides together. Just using Elmer's wood glue. It's an easy cleanup with water. And uh, we want to make sure that if it does spill, that it's spilling outward, not inward. Don't use too much. Those are the tips that I'd give you. And then just to make sure that it, there aren't any spots missed, we'll rub the, uh, the bead with our finger. Make sure that it's... Um, you know, fully on there, fully coated with at least a little bit of wood glue. Just a little bit does do the trick. Since we're going to clamp this down, uh, we really don't need a lot of glue. It'll set well. It'll bond very, very tight. My experience with this wood glue is, is great. It's basically like an industry standard, so it does have a great track record. Getting the clamps to stay um, is, is a little bit difficult. And also, a few things you want to make sure Number one, the blade still fits into the scabbard while it's being clamped. Um, you may over tighten it and find out that the blade is actually stuck tight. That's not going to work at all. Another issue that you might have is if your clamps are uneven, you might actually be causing it to be glued in a, in a warped position the way that you might intentionally warp a shield. And you don't want that either because the whole thing will be messed up and you've already spent a lot of time uh, making sure that it fits precisely so we don't want that so get this clamp really well uh, you can use as many clamps as you need to if you happen to have a carpenter's workbench you're probably better off than most people uh, in the sense that you've got the right tools so I would use that but if not just use these C clamps these work great or these uh, Irwin clamps those are super cheap as well and once we've got it all clamped, we want to make sure it's leaning, like I said, in a way that doesn't cause the whole thing to be warped. We don't want to glue it in a warped position. I've skipped the actual process of showing you the sanding because it seems pretty self-explanatory. But we've got it all sanded here, and I've done this to a very acute point, maybe too sharply uh, pointed there. But um, I feel like I'm not going to be using a, uh, a shape at this time. So I want it to be pretty sharp at the bottom there. Uh, I think it'll just look better. In terms of what I use to sand, the best tool that you have is that wood planer. Um, those are not expensive and they can profile the whole scabbard. If you have to, um, you know, use also a disc sander. And uh, so mine actually fits very well. It's tight. It's not going to come out on its own. Um, it actually takes a little bit of effort to get it out, and uh, it looks pretty nice. It's not perfect, but I think uh, so far the project looks okay from here. So we're going to move on to the next step, which is sealing it uh, and adding some risers. Um, we seal it with a Helmsman spar urethane. That's what I'm using. You don't have to use that. You could use any other type of varnish that you want to. And like I said in the last video I made about making scabbards, um, you want to seal it so that the moisture from the leather is not absorbed uh, into the wood, which would cause the leather to crack and just look awful. So we're sealing that. That's the real reason. Uh, it obviously does provide some protection against uh, like water resistance as well, although probably won't need it. You have the leather there, but once we're done with that, what we need to do is start working on the strap. So I've got this particular strap. It's just a guide. The varnish is thoroughly dry now at this point. And so uh, it is certainly ready for the risers to be placed on here. I'm lining this up with the last scabbard that I made. I like where the risers are here. So I'm going to put them at the um, same exact places. Pretty close to the same exact places. And then we'll just glue these on. I found that barge all-purpose cement works really well for sealing these risers on. Um, I don't know what I like about it so much, but it, it seems to be super secure. And uh, so just a preference. There are obviously other types um, of glue that you can use. I wouldn't use a water-based glue. You want something that's going to bond well both to the leather. And then you have the varnished or polyurethane a wood so you want a glue that's going to be pretty strong with both of those types of materials so 
cut these out. These are just uh, leather strips or leather lace. You can make these yourself if you want or just buy the lace and then make sure they're pretty well glued before attaching them. This glue tends to dry really quickly. So I found that it is possible to, to mess things up a little bit and get these on crooked if you're not careful. So you may want to be even more precise than I'm being here and, uh, and take a ruler um, and make sure that that line is drawn so it's really clear. And we're making sure that all of the seams are on one side. So where they come together, that's all on the back or the front, depending on how we orient this. But uh, this process doesn't take too long at all. When we've got that, what we want to do is uh, get ready to cut out our leather. So we need to cut out a big piece of leather, but uh, at the same time, we don't want to be too wasteful. So I've made this paper pattern. I think I had this last time as well. It hasn't really changed. I cut out a piece of leather that's bigger than the paper pattern, uh, feeling like you know the leather will probably shrink a little bit. Because I'm planning to actually tool this, um, if you have tooling on that, you know, you've invested time. And so, like I said, the worst thing that could happen is it, it's too small, something like that. And I suppose you could try to fix things by going back into the wood scabbard and making that smaller, uh, sanding it more, but it's just such a hassle. Let's make sure we cut out enough leather here so we don't have that issue. I use these big scissors. Um, they work great. You can use... You know, an X-Acto knife that works as well. And then once we get that cut out, it's it's sort of the general shape of the scabbard. It's not perfect. Um, it, it will actually need to be trimmed down because I've cut out too much and I just don't know how much that leather is going to shrink. If I was making the same scabbard for the same blade over and over, I'm sure I'd have a great idea of approximately how much shrinking is going to happen. The other thing I did is actually took the scabbard, traced it on the paper, and then I cut it out. And the reason I did this is so I'd have basically what is the front of the scabbard, or the shape of the front of the scabbard. I also have the full piece of leather as well traced out on this paper. So I have basically two patterns. So we've cut out that leather, and the next thing we're going to do is a little different than what we've done before. Uh, we are going to do some tooling. I, the last scabbard that I made for you was very plain, very basic. It was alright, but it lacked detail. So I'm going to add some details. I've got this tool here, which can carve a little groove. It's pretty useful. Never used it before, and so I'm sort of testing it here. Um, we are going to try to put some designs on this scabbard. Some designs that have some historical significance. So that's important. It's not just something we whipped up out of nothing. Um, but, you know, at the same time, since I'm doing this for the first time, um, it may not be perfect. In fact, I don't expect it to be perfect. At the top of the scabbard, near the throat, I'm going to do a little picture there. I'm not too confident about how it's going to look. Um, but right here, just going to be creating a little window there, two inches wide. And then I'm going to use the groover, or whatever it's called, this little tool here, to cut out that window. This is the verse of a coin. A Jerusalem cross is depicted here. This is like a crusader coin. So I thought it would be cool to have like a crusader motif here. Um, so that's what I'm going with freehand, uh, just pressing it in with this stylus. I'm just going to press it into the leather. The leather is wet, and then I'm going to use a few of these punches or stamps to uh, make an impression into the uh, moist or damp leather. Uh, it will leave whatever you, leave, you know, whatever you put in there. Um, you can use a mallet or a hammer. Um, to put these designs in there and you know you're free to do whatever design pleases you I probably could have just looked at someone else's and found one that I liked and used it but um, I wanted it to be somewhat unique 
And so for the top of the scabbard near the throat, I'm also going to just freehand this uh, with a stylus. Also, this might be a good place for a swivel knife um, to cut that out of the leather, maybe make it deeper, but just giving it a try here with a stylus. Um, uh, this is also not an original piece of artwork that I'm doing. At least it's, it's not like from my mind. This is actually um, based on a medallion. Um, so I'm right now I'm looking at that medallion trying to uh, copy it as best as I can and I wanted it also to have a crusader theme so that the the top of the scabbard sort of matches the bottom of the scabbard um, at least if you if you know what you're looking at there it might seem like they go together um, so what am I using specifically to look at um, it is the Richard the Lionheart seal. It looks like this. And um, it's like a crusader knight. We want to keep this leather moist. Um, so continually wetting it, making sure that uh, it doesn't dry out too much. Another thing that I'm doing differently here is actually putting in the carving before we sew it up. And this is really going to help because uh, in the past, every scabbard I've made, I've had the thing all sewn up and then you have to carve into the leather which is already attached to the wood um, and you know the problem with that is that you're scarring up the wood probably underneath and not sure how badly but maybe if your knife is sharp and you go over it enough it could be causing that to be somewhat damaged. You know, Once we're done with that again we're going to be getting the uh, leather wet it's ready to put on the scabbard so we need to uh, get it wet so we can mold it. This is very similar to the process that we used before that I've shown you. The other tricky thing here is that we need to uh, make sure all of the horizontal and vertical lines line up. If I didn't have any of those, it probably wouldn't matter how centered it looked because you could add those lines later. That's actually something that I hadn't really planned for. Uh, if I had the chance to do this again, I'd put those vertical and horizontal lines on after I sewed up the uh, the scabbard so that it looks like they're straight and there's no hassle with you know trying to make them actually straight before putting it on. But in any case, you know that's that's what this project brings, a few challenges here. So we mold the uh, the leather just by pressing into it with our fingers, try not to leave any fingernail marks. And, uh, and try to get this as straight as possible. At the same time, you can already see that the leather is um, not quite soaked at the bottom. Uh, when it starts to evaporate, the water does, and it starts to lighten in color, you know you'll want to put some more water on it. Uh, keep it moist. If you let it dry out and you wet it and you let it dry out again, you do that over and over, you're probably you know, going to be damaging the leather, I would imagine. You're letting it dry out way too much. The other struggle here is to know how much leather to leave. You can already see that I'm, I've got it cut down the side a little bit here, uh, trimming it up because we really don't want those two halves to overlap. We want them to come, you know, just meet each other in the middle with just the slightest extra amount because in my experience the leather will shrink. So we don't want there to be a gap there. I suppose you could you could actually paint this scabbard brown or black uh, where the stitching will be so that if it does separate at all it looks good because it still looks dark there but uh, I didn't do that maybe that would be something to do next time uh, or just you know, I, like I said keep a little extra make sure it overlaps just the smallest amount so that when uh, everything stretches out you know, when it shrinks a little bit uh, there should be a pretty good fit so continuing to trim this as we get near the bottom and my stitches get a little bit smaller and closer together. The next thing is going to be the dye and the stain. In the past what we've used is just dye and that worked pretty well but I wanted to bring out the tooling here so I've got Phoebe's dark brown antique finish. I'm just going to glob it on with a dauber. Uh, this is like a wool dauber and um, and just going to smother the leather which is a little bit damp still. Just gonna put it on really liberally and uh, 
make sure that we don't have parts of it um, that receive a lot of dye and, and then other parts get dye later. We want it to all go on at the same time. So I'm using just a whole lot of the finish right here and going to coat it and then much like the dye we're going to rub off the excess but hopefully all of the little recesses uh, will take that dye and when we rub off the top you know we're just going to make sure we don't reach too deeply into those recesses we don't want um, to catch all that dye we want to leave some of it there in those cracks and crevices and that'll give it an interesting look and uh, see how this works now I noticed before I even began that the leather wasn't perfect it had spots on it and maybe from I have no idea I could be wrong about this but maybe from scars of you know insect bites kind of sounds gross but there were all sorts of blemishes in the leather and you can see that those spots didn't take it too well it didn't absorb as much finish so not really a problem but you know if I was a professional there's probably not a way you could sell this the way it is so to remedy that I thought it would be good to use this dark brown uh, Phoebe's Pro dye and I'm using it on the whole back so not going to mess with the antique finish in the back. There's not any tooling back there anyways. And so if we just use that on the back entirely and then maybe on the front as well. Um, I'm going to see if the spots that didn't accept the, um, the antique finish will accept the dye. The dye is more of a liquid, whereas the antique was more of like a paste. So I used the leather dye on the front, tried to blend it, but it doesn't blend very well. So what we do here is uh, just see if we can blend it using the antique finish. The antique finish is not nearly as opaque, and so because it is somewhat transparent, I'm going to see if we can use it to blend the, uh, the dye, the dark brown dye. And um, I've also used that dark brown dye to try to offset that shape on the bottom. You can see there that um, it comes to a point there. Then also doing something a little different here as well with the, uh, with the coating, the top coat or the finish. Instead of using the EcoFlow Super Sheen that we've used in the past, that I've used for all of my scabbards, I'm trying this uh, Phoebing's Saddle Lac. So it's supposed to be flexible, protective, uh, high gloss, and that's the main thing. If you look at it compared to the last scabbard, it's much glossier, and it does look different. hope it doesn't look too much like plastic, um, but, uh, you know, it does, it does give it quite a glossy look, and I like that part. The other thing we need to do now is get those straps all ready. I haven't done the straps yet, so... We'll need to get the straps finished, and to do that, using a pencil to, uh, to mark out the spots. Another thing that is different this time, instead of um, having to deal with the fact that in the very front of the scabbard you have to stretch it open where we make that opening, this time I'm going to actually leave enough space in the middle and also widen it a little bit there. Um, so hopefully you can see this. So it looks like it's been opened up when in fact I've just covered or cut the leather uh, to, uh, to be a little wider. You should be able to see that in a minute here. The next thing here, what we're going to do is um, use this tool to give the edge of the strap a little bevel there. Uh, make it look like it's a little more worn. You know, it hasn't just simply been cut right out of the leather. It's got a little... Um, a little bevel there and that bevel I think it gives it a, a nice look uh, a more finished look uh, as opposed to just having a, a straight edge right there so I'll see how this works I'm gonna go down the each side every side you can see right there how it's widened a little bit so it's it's wider I did that on purpose because we're gonna cut that out you can see it's already cut out here I've got uh, the holes for the front of the strap. I'm not going to deal with a buckle. You know, I'm, I just 
have, I'm tired of trying to find buckles and shapes. And until I find a good supplier, hopefully that's in the U.S., I know there are some good suppliers outside of the U.S., but until I find a good one, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm simply going to have the belt tie up. And uh, there's certainly a historical precedent for that. Not all scabbards had shapes, so it's not really a requirement. And then the next thing here, you can see how the uh, opening there should make this easier to put together. The next thing is we need to choose a color for the, the belts. We could go blue, dark blue. I thought about that. I actually thought about that for the whole scabbard. A uh, nice blue like that with a high gloss would look nice, but um, you know I chose the brown. And to offset the brown, we need something different. So got a few choices here. I can barely tell the difference between these. This is sa saddle tan. The other color is, um, I think it's called bridal tan maybe or bridal uh, English bridal is what it's called and so there there's these are very similar colors I'm gonna go with the saddle tan uh, it's a nice light um, warm brown uh, it should look pretty good overall um, I've got it all finished here and uh, it's ready to attach this part is you know, if you need to see what this looks like again, I mean, if you need to know how to do this, just take a look at the other video I made. Uh, you can see most of these parts going on. And um, this does take some time to get all these pieces through here. As I mentioned before last time, I try to use as many tools as I can that work. And so that white piece of plastic is a ceramics tool, but it works pretty well to open up these holes. I'm definitely happy that um, put the holes in or you know those slits in the leather before sewing on the leather that made it a lot easier and then it's just a matter of assembling the belt so that strap goes underneath and around the back and when it goes through the middle of the back it's going to get pushed down it's going to get um, you know goes through really makes it secure and that's what we've got here goes through the middle of that strap when we pull that down that's super tight it's not gonna be moving uh, and then gonna deal with the middle piece here uh, this piece is uh, I don't think I showed you this last time so I'm gonna show you now you just poke this little piece through and this is gonna be easier than last time as well since last time I had more fiddling to do uh, with that middle piece and then we just we put that through the, uh, the scabbard. Um, once it's through the scabbard, we'll thread it back through the belt. Hope that makes sense. Uh, always cover up the work as well with a piece of cloth to, uh, to make sure that you don't scar the surface uh, before it's even been used. You don't want a bunch of scuff marks unless that's what you're, you're going for there, distressing it. But uh, definitely not the case with this one. So when you pull this through, just to make sure there's enough room, cut it a little bit more with the X-Acto knife. And, uh, and then these two pieces are going to go through the other belt and then around the front. We'll try a different knot this time. Last time it was just like a simple knot. I don't know, a square knot or something like that. But I'm going to borrow a knot that I've you know seen elsewhere, like online or in other belts. Um, just to give it a little bit of flair or a little bit, uh, something a little special, a little bit eye-catching here. So I'm trying to show you exactly how this is put together. I hope you can tell, you know, which end goes where. Um, rewind that if you need to, to see that again. But it's pretty easy to put this little uh, knot together and then just tighten that until it's uh, very tight. And it comes together in sort of a, a diamond shape or I suppose a square. If you want, you can add a little bit of glue there if you prefer on the inside of the leather, just so that leather not, uh, you know, will remain, but it's up to you. So here it is, a new nightly scabbard. And this is one that I'll add to my collection. Um, there's some things that I like about it, some things that could have been better. Uh, maybe I'll do another scabbard with simply the tooling. I think that part could probably be improved upon. 
But in any case, thanks for being with me today. Uh, if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. Uh, I'd love to have you here following along, seeing what kind of the things I make, and feel free to give me suggestions and comments. Um, it's, it's a two-way street, you know. I'm listening to you. I hope that you hear from me if you have any questions uh, or comments. Um, I'm going to put it on. Let's see how it looks. If you haven't seen the other scabbard making video, um, go ahead and check that out as well.